a forum on property tax, everything you ever want to know about property taxes, uh, and then some. Uh, I'm State Senator Andrew Benardis. We are, uh, this is my district, or the 22nd district from Bay Ridge all the way up to Marine Park. Uh, so glad to see so many of you here. I'm joined by my colleague in the Senate, Senator Brian Benjamin, who also is the chairman of the uh, Revenue and Budget Committee. Uh, and uh, you know, talking about property taxes, property taxes, and property tax reform is a topic that we've been discussing for uh, basically since I got into office in January. Uh, and this is truly meant to be the start of the public engagement process that the Senate is really undertaking uh, as we look towards reforming and fixing the property tax system here in New York City. This is actually the third or fourth, third uh, panel or uh, forum that's been held citywide so far. Uh, I'm really happy that we're able to bring this here to our district as well. We have two other speakers uh, with us tonight as well. First is Anna Champany from the Citizens Budget Commission, who will talk a little bit about, uh, give us a bit of an overview of the property tax system. And then we have Ian uh, Stoyotis from the uh, Mutual Housing Association of New York, uh, who will talk about some of the resources that are available for homeowners uh, as they're trying to navigate the challenges of their property taxes. We also have a representative from the Department of Finance in the back, in the corner there. So if you have specific questions about your tax bill, if you think you're eligible for exemptions or exceptions or discounts or rebates or cookies or whatever you want, uh, see the Department of Finance back there. And I have members of my staff in the other corner as well. So if you have any other questions, potholes, street lights, traffic, you know, whatever, my staff is here to help with So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Senator Benjamin and we will begin. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yes, hello. Uh, so, um, as you mentioned, my name is uh, State Senator Brian Benjamin. I represent Harlem, East Harlem, uh, and the sort of West Side. And I am the chairman of the Budget and Revenue Committee. Uh, this is the committee that is responsible to deal with everything that has to do with taxes. Uh, property taxes, personal taxes, uh, corporate business taxes. That's what gets us to my committee. Committee's perfect. I just want to let you know that your senator, Andrew Bernard, when the second got elected, came to me and said, we need to talk about property taxes. I need to in my district. We need to have some solutions that help to create more fairness in our property taxes. Just as a quick um, sort of uh, context provider, the mayor of the city of New York um, is, has a property tax commission. That commission has been meeting for a while. That property tax commission is to uh, provide recommendations um, in the next month or so, uh, I have some for personally from the mayor of Bosnia that we will get uh, proposals in Albany next year for us to look at. Uh, the reason why we're having a Senate-based um, uh, uh, community forums across the city is because we want to hear directly from our residents who are most deeply impacted so that when we get their recommendations, we're able to say, okay, well, maybe some of this, maybe some of that. Ultimately, it's our decision um, about how we move forward with property taxes. So I just want to give you some of that context. We are doing six companies across the city. We've already done two that was mentioned before. One was in Harlem, one was in, uh, in uh, Southeast Queens. Now we're here and we're also also doing uh, uh, one in the Bronx and Staten Island and Brooklyn as well. So we are uh, moving across the city to make sure we hear a variety of uh, thoughts. I will, um, at this time, I just want to give a quick presentation of one of the things we learned in my the first uh, town hall is that we assumed that everyone was an expert on property taxes and property tax bills and came quickly to find out that that's not the case. So what, we, what we've done is I'm going to give a quick overview of how a uh, property tax bill is and then we'll turn over to a presentation that will be more um, uh, into the policy and organizational components of that. So let me start with this uh, department's presentation that's up here. Let's go to slide one, property, real property tax basis, the next one. All right, next slide. Okay, so I hope you can see this, but this is typically what a property tax bill looks like. We have our good friends from the Department of Finance in the back. Um, this is what a, a bill looks like. And what, we, what I just want to do is just try to give you a sense of, um, give you a sense of how this all gets calculated. So most people care 
about this account right here, the amount due, how much you have to pay. So what I'm going to do is just go through how the system comes up with getting to that number. All right? And the future price of the property plan is mentioned before. Next slide. All right, so top of your bill, there will be an amount due, quote payment, your name, your address, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. All right, at the bottom of the bill, this is where a lot of the action is. So we'll talk about this in detail. Next slide. All right, so what do we, what do we tell the bottom of the bill show? It shows the value of your home or business, how much of that value is taxed, what the tax rate is, uh, what reduction applied, what reduction applied to the value, uh, and how much is generally owed. Next slide. All right, first is tax class. What tax class are we with? There are four tax classes uh, in the city of New York. Uh, this is the, um, this is the uh, property bill for a individual homeowner. And so individual homeowners are in typically tax class one if you own uh, less than four, four units. So that's called, typically called a small home. So that is tax class. Go to the next slide. So there are four tax classes that I mentioned. One is class one, residential property over three units. Class two are rental co-ops and condos. Um, there are different classifications than that. If you have those concerns, obviously we have some to help you with that. Class three are utilities, condensing, et cetera, and our plants. And then class four for commercial industrial properties, office, towers, facilities, kind of like the businesses that we look. Next slide. I'll, I'll finish this and I'll go to So, next slide. So, after other, no, no, no. So, right underneath tax class is the estimated market value. That estimated market value is determined by the city department of finance. Okay? Let me just go through how that gets determined. The next slide. So, if you're in class one, which is, you know, um, residents of, kind of, of the three, of, of the three units, it's typically similar, similar buildings in your neighborhood, um, and they, they try to get a sense of what's the sort of comparable uh, numbers there. If you're in class two, which is the rental co-ops and the co on the condo, et cetera, it's the, the rental in income of similar buildings. It's typically what they use to measure those. Class three is utilities, and I'm not really sure what cost means, but that's what I was told the main department finance to explain that. But most people in here are not in class three, they're not, they're not kind of in or et cetera. Class one to a four, and in class four, uh, which is the commercial, uh, it's, it's usually based on how much income you generate, and they, and they make determinations based on that. That's typically the, what goes into this, determining what that estimated market value is. All right, the next slide. All right, so now you went through tax class, and we, and, and we talked a little bit about estimated market value. Now we're going to get to how much is taxed, and that is the billable assessed value. Okay, so let's talk about how that comes about. Next slide. So the biblical set value is basically, it takes the market value, which is the market value, and you multiply that by the assessment ratio. Okay, so for class one, the assessment ratio is up to 6% of the market value. And so if you go back a slide, back a slide, if you multiply that 323,000 by 6%, you will get a number a little bit over this 18 out of 9 number. So in this person's case, um, it is like 5.8% of that exact number. But your, if you're class one, your biblical assessed value cannot be over 6%, that's the 6% or under. And if you're not class one for every other one class, it's 45% of the, of the uh, estimated market value. Alright, so how do we arrive at the tax rate? Let's go back to the slide. Because the tax rate is just a different uh, go back to the slide. Sorry about that. I think there's something that's right. This number here, the tax rate for this person is 19.991%. Anyone know how this tax rate is determined? Uh, I don't know either. <laughs> no, it's no this 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 right here is where the complications come in. This is this is actually part of why we're here right now. This tax 
rate gets determined based upon what the city needs to fund its, ob its obligations. So that number doesn't have a real basis in something, how I say, uh, completely statutory or objective. It's based on, it's a, it's, a, it's a way to solve for an equation to get to how much money the city needs to fund um, spending. All right, next slide, next slide. And then I, I talked about, I just kind of talked about that here. Uh, and right now in the city of New York, there is a, a certain amount of, a certain share that each um, property class is expected to generate in order to provide the city's budget. And that's the tax rate. All right, next slide. So then what you basically do is you multiply the little assessed value by the tax rate that is manufactured and you get to uh, that person's taxes, okay? And that's your tax for the year. Now, depending on whether or not you have any abatement, as I mentioned earlier, any exemptions or abatements, that gets um, subtracted from the um, from that tax number. So in this case, this person has a star abatement, actually um, star abatement, that and that amount is an assessment, I'm sorry. This is no that's an, that's an assessment. That assessment is 1550, you multiply that by the tax rate, that gets you to 309, you take that tax, the annual tax of 3780 minus 309, it gets this person's actual total um, property tax, which is 3,471. If you divide that number by four, because you pay your property taxes quarterly, that gets you to this person 867.75. Uh, next slide. And I just walked through how that all happened, right? So exemptions and abatements. And, um, and, and that's how you get the next slide. And there are various exemptions and abatements. I'm sure some of you are familiar with these. There's a star, there are uh, exemptions for veterans, disabled senior citizens, co op condo abatements, 421A, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 421A is tied to um, the, the prop up. So buildings that have been, that have been built in neighborhoods where there was a desire to Buildings where they got these tax abatements, um, typically 25 years. But that's that's not normally for an individual, that's more for uh, uh, some developments kind of things. Alright, next slide. And so I talked through all this, I guess I didn't wait to get here, but basically I just was explaining you how we got to the three plus that one. Next slide. Alright, next slide is built quarterly. And then that's where you are. So let's go to the last slide. So here's the issue, um, and I'll turn this over here. City spending. So if you go back to 2009, city spending, the city budget was about $60 billion. The latest budgetary uh, number that I was told in 2019, $92 billion. So from 60 to 92, that's $32 billion in, I don't know, about 10 years. That $32 billion has to get funded somehow. What we do in the city of New York is we fund it primarily through property taxes. And as some of you might be aware, there's a lot of times about unfairness how some people are paying more in property taxes than someone who owns an apartment that is worth more, a house that's worth more. I'll let Anna get into that. I don't want to steal my thunder, but you know, within the system, if you are in class one, you think when you bought your home or condo or whatever, um, there are property tax caps that are applied to you in terms of your property tax money grows six percent a year or over five years. So as you can imagine, if someone's living in a neighborhood that has experienced rapid, rapid gentrification, but they bought their their home at a time when its value is much less, they're protected from that rapid increase. And so that's part of the reason how you make it. But I'm gonna handle that one. One of the things that myself and some of the artists are going to be on the Senate is we are going to be focused very, very carefully. Oh, I'm sorry, it's too fast. You know what it is? I'm so sorry because my concern was that if, you know, I want to answer your question. So I'm going to do that. So one of the things that Senator Bernardus and I will be doing in, um, in the Senate is we're going to be having conversations. We're waiting to hear what the mayor's uh, responses are. We're being told by the mayor that they want to do a very comprehensive, overarching.
department change the system, um, depending upon what that is, we might need to look at some things that are incremental that make a real difference on the margin. So one of the things that we're trying to do in some of these conversations is here's my idea that those that are passive ideas. Um, we want to make sure that we try to provide as much fairness as we can within the system. And I want to thank the citizen artists for putting pressure on us to get to get out here and make sure we have these conversations with these constituents. So I want to thank you, Senator Jones, for doing this and uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I'm sorry I spoke too quickly, but I will answer all the questions in the world. I just want to give you a quick overview uh, before we go to another presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Benjamin. Uh, I also want to acknowledge we have representatives here from Senator Prasad and Senator Salazar's office, so uh, I want to thank them and their offices for being here. Uh, we're going to take as many questions as you have. It's easier for us. We have no cards that our staff can pass around just to write it down. We don't have the same question asked five times in five different ways. It'll be easier for everyone. So staff can pass around no cards. We'll get to every question. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ben Chaffney to uh, give us a, brief, a bit of an overview as to how all these pieces work together uh, and how some of these structural inequities and all these things that you're all furious about about taxes, how they all came to be. Thank you.
less than 13% of 45% of your value. So the nominal tax rates are not good for comparison, and they don't necessarily mean that class one is twice what the class two or three does. Um, and what we usually use is we use something called an effective tax rate, which looks at taxes as a share of your market value, and kind of ignores all of this noise that the assessment system makes. So, let's talk about And 
then below that is what the Department of Finance market value was at that time. And lastly, it's a, it's a ratio, so how close was the Department of Finance to the sale price? So on the class one home, it sold for it. It's 530, um, and the Department of Finance had a value in the high 448. It's like 90%. It's not that far off. Um, and that makes sense because they use data on sales in order to do their models, um, and they're generally not that far off. If you look at the condo unit, there's a requirement to assess co-ops and condos as if they were rental buildings, and that generates market values that are substantially lower than the sales prices. A lot of folks have written about this. They will point to apartments where the value of the entire building is less than the sale price of one unit. Um, and it, it shows, so in this case, it's a $1.2 million apartment that finance assessed at $160,000, so 12% of the value. But remember, they're still assessed at 45% of that 12, or 45% of that 160, instead of 6%. So, you know, it does stay complicated. Um, the larger uh, rental and office buildings are closer to 30, 40, 50%, but they're still substantially below, uh, below the sales price. Uh, we think this is a particular issue because if the value that you start with, the value that you get under notice of property value doesn't really reflect what you think your property is worth, it undermines the credibility of the whole system, and it also makes it hard for people to compare. How do you compare your tax on a one-family home to a condo unit if the valuations are so different and represent really different? Uh, so the second is the distribution of levy according to class shares. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the impact here is in the effective tax rate, so the tax burden for what portion of the market value is paid for each year in taxes is higher, especially for commercial buildings and large rental buildings, than it is for homeowners, co-ops, and condos. So a one-family home in New York City, a one-district family home has an median effective tax rate of 0.87. Uh, so if you own, if you're lucky enough to own like a million dollar home in New York, that means your taxes would be eight thousand seven hundred dollars. Um, if you own a million dollar co-op or condo, and here I made the adjustment for the valuation, you would pay about ten thousand um, dollars. And then the, the numbers get much higher for the commercial property. So the, the, the third piece, and I think this is the one that causes the most frustration for homeowners, is that there are a lot of inequities within class one, there are within class two. Uh, so here's the map, this is the median effective tax rate, so the median tax burden for taxes relative to market value for one, two, three family homes in New York City, my neighborhood. The lighter the color, the lower the tax burden. So here in my chart, slow or Manhattan, uh, those are the lowest tax burdens, and that is because of very rapid
some recommendations. One is that you put co-ops and condos with class one, that all owner-occupied properties should be treated the same way and assessed based on sales. The second is that this valuation system needs to be improved, that the value of your notice of value should be comparable to what you think your home or your business is worth. The third is that you need to eliminate these class shares and caps because they lead to these inequities between properties of the same type and across different types of properties worth the same. Um, and lastly is that there should be a circuit breaker. So a circuit breaker is a targeted property tax program that says if your property taxes exceed a certain percentage of your income, you could get a refundable tax credit that would offset some of your property tax liability. And we think that this is the better way to provide tax relief because it looks directly at the ability to pay and assesses whether or not the individual's tax bill is a burden to them. Thank you. Before we get to the question, before we get to questions, I do want to give Amy uh, a chance to uh, introduce yourself, to talk about her organization that's here in the back services they can provide and then I have the cards all here we'll take questions and comments and everything okay Fixing this. 
And so what happens when you don't fix a problem year after year after year? It compounds and compounds and compounds until we get to where we are today. So yes, this should have been fixed 20 years ago. This should have been fixed 10 years ago. This should have been fixed five years ago. We're not here to point fingers. We're not here to yell the to feel better. We know it's broken. We have to fix it, and that's what we're here to do today. That's the start of a very long conversation we need to be having about how do we move forward from here. Thank you. 
got the second piece of that for, for people whose household incomes is greater than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So I did have that. I forgot to mention that. But my, so my bill removes the cap for homes over three million if you have a household income over two hundred and fifty. Yeah. So it, it protects the teachers. It protects the top of the fire. Yeah. 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 That's 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 a problem not on property taxes. That's a problem on housing affordability generally, and housing availability generally. It's a much different conversation. It, it's, it's a much different conversation. It's a but it's 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 a problem about the supply of housing in the rural in the city. Excuse me. We're gonna hold on. We're gonna go through the cards that we have. Okay. But hold on, hold on. We're gonna go through the cards that we have. If you have additional questions, please fill out a card. I want to make sure we get into everyone. We did say we're going to take people. There were, there were two cards about the Blasio question. And we answered both those cards with this very long answer. So I want to be fair to everyone that submitted the questions on the card that we asked them to. You can put a comment on the card, put a question, but I do want to make sure we're sticking to the process for everyone. Okay? Okay, so I think we're going to go to the cards first. Let me go to the cards first, okay? I have to go to the cards first. I said something to the effect that the end of the So class three or first utility, not homes. Homes are not in the, they're not class three. I was when I talked about cost, that was class three. Right? Class three. Cost of the house is part of no, no, I'm saying when I mentioned cost and how the value is determined, that was related to class. That was related to class three, not the first one. Okay. So. Sorry, take the questions that are written. I, I can't take your question. I asked everyone to write down questions. Write down the cards. We'll take it. Okay. So the first question we have here, and if we can't answer it, we will pass it on. We'll also, the Department of Finance can help chime in as well. Please change the law so that condos and vaults are not taxed like rentals. These are not property corporations. They are people's homes. So that's one of the proposals that the CPC that Emma talked about was to move the cost of condos into the class one, like regular residential housing. Not like rental houses. That's something that they did have been out there for a while, and I think it deserves a lot of attention and a lot of consideration as we look towards reform next year. Why is assessment going up by 60% and inflation is near zero and pay growth is about zero? Very good question. That's what I think we're all scratching our heads trying to figure out. Again, the city has to figure out. The city has to, basically they do their budget from the back. They figure out what they're spending and they figure out how they're going to raise what they have to do in order to match all their spending. And that's how they figure out how much they have to raise the assessments on everyone's individual profits. Now, it's a bit backwards because we all know when we make our budgets, we see how much we have in our pockets and then how much we can afford after that, not the other way around. But that's the way the city does their, their budgeting process and that's how the current system is set up to do. That's one of the things we need to look at in terms of fixing that, that process. That does not make sense to any of us here. That, that's not how we operate our households, our families, our own personal finances. So uh, understand a thousand percent that we agree does not make that much sense. What factors determine market value? Because what are some things that might help younger community? We'll get to the next. What are the factors that determine market value? I believe that's just the sale of the, that property or neighboring properties on the block in the neighborhood, right? Right. So, so the department does a statistical model and they look at rents. And they look at the year that the house was built, they have data on whether it was renovated, the square footage, um, they have some variables about what kind it is. And then they're looking at rents. That means the prior question the, the value that the finance is putting on the property is to reflect the real estate market. And that's part of the challenge is that. The real estate market in New York City is hot, and it has you know, far exceeded income growth and everything else, and that's created the, the difficulty in, in bills that I think most of us are having. The second question there was, what are some plans that might help younger community members who grew up in this neighborhood stay and buy a home here? Yes. 
Great question, great question. Uh, actually, last year during the campaign, I proposed an idea to create a first-time home buyer savings program to let people save tax-free for their down payment. I thought I had this great, brilliant idea. I get to all the to work on it, and I realized that someone else already had the idea, and actually the state is working on creating regulations to make this happen at a pilot program level. So they're still working on that. That's just one example, right? Uh, years ago, they used to have housing for public workforce, right? They used to have special loan programs and opportunities for teachers and cops and firefighters and things like that. I think we should be revisiting those programs. I know some uh, lending institutions might offer some discounts on you know, mortgage rates and whatever based on civil service status. But I think it's worth looking at how do we keep our public workforce able to stay in the city and find ways to create special housing or special housing opportunities for the teachers, the cops, the firefighters, the city doctors, city nurses, sanitation workers, all those things like that. I don't know if anyone wants to send in there. Uh, yeah. uh, so that's exactly what we need to discuss, right? Uh, and it's very unfortunate because just to go backwards and go forwards. So in 2009, 2008, when the market crashed, um, the banks just completely pulled out of, of commercial mortgages, right? They just stopped it. And um, prior to that, organizations like Manning had worked really hard with other organizations in the city to get the banks to really have some very, very competitive, affordable products where people could, it would help people buy homes, right? They had grants that went along with it. They had um, special programs with mark, uh, with below market interest rates. You could take the grant and lower the interest rate. There were all of these programs. So in 2008, what happened is basically, even though the uh, homeowners that organizations like Fannie and Council did not lose their homes because we had been careful and they had been protected through counseling, the banks threw the babies out of the network. And they didn't look at, at the fact that the homeowners we had been counseling were actually providing stability in the marketplace. They just threw all the products out. So we have spent the last 10 years actually working and negotiating and trying to get the banks back to understanding the low and moderate and middle income people are a very good bet for promotion. And, and we're, we're, we're making some headway. So again, um, if that's something you're looking for, people you know, if your children are looking for, please just give us your name in the back and we're happy to reach out. The second problem is the one that the Senator spoke to about supply. There is no program and the city Again, for 10 years, did almost no home ownership development at all. And so, again, we have been working with several other organizations, working with the city housing department to prioritize building home homes, condos, co-ops, one, two, three family homes. And they are finally coming out of their cocoon and are going to, have, and are starting to um, actually generate those program for those homes out of the city. And, and just to piggyback on that, over to the next question, you know, we see this build, building boom everywhere across the city, all these luxury condos where you know, they're selling studios for $2 million, which is asinine and completely ridiculous. You know, one fourth of all of the new development that's been built since 2013 is vacant because no one can afford it. So they're building all this luxury housing, they're not building enough affordable housing. And middle income housing and lower income housing um, for, for people in the outer boroughs, and that's been a huge problem as well. So, if, if everyone recognizes this problem, we need to do a lot more on the city side, not on the private side, to be incentivizing and investing in affordable housing. Affordable housing is not just low income housing. Affordable housing is a teacher and a firefighter, both first years of the job, and they're making just under $100,000. That's affordable housing too. Uh, Especially for the areas like ours. So that's the big thing we can focus on. Next question. Is property tax higher if property is not owner occupied? So that's one of our experts tackle that out. It could be. It, it, there, it's not a, a cross the board situation. Uh, the STAR program, the STAR exemption is for owner occupied uh, properties with an income cap of 500000 um, And then the co op and condo banking, which is a tax uh, reduction program. Well, condo owners is also for primary residents only, so if it's a Piedra or an investment property, it doesn't get the tax reduction. 
property tax is 30% of spending and growing. Why? It was 20%. I know the director of Ethan said this is unusual demand of 20% limit. I assume this means a 20% limit on the city's budget growth. Uh, I have to assume this question means, and I agree. I think. Spending. I'm sorry? 20% of spending. Spending, right. So the, 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 the chart that Senator Benjamin showed over the last 10 years, the city's budget has grown by $32 billion. You know, holy cow, I wish I had, you know, one hundredth of that to pay off my student loans or something, right? Uh, that's hugely problematic, and that's what's feeding into the rise in property taxes that we're all facing. So uh, I don't know how practical it is for the, the state to impose a limit on the city necessarily, and they did that in the 70s. Uh, I don't know if we will do that again, but your point is very valid. With the same budget growing so rapidly, it's creating this upward pressure on property taxes, and that's the problem. We have to get a rein on the spending part um, as well. But the flip side of that is if we want to pay our cops a higher salary, we want to pay our firefighters a higher salary, and we want to do more things in the city, we have to figure out what our priorities are. So we can look at spending, we can look at increasing spending in certain areas, decreasing in certain areas. Uh, we can all look at there's waste, you know, everywhere. The city, the state, the federal government, no disagreement there. But we have to honestly look at what we what we are willing as a public to invest money in. And if we want to have, you know, classrooms that are no longer overcrowded, that's going to cost us some money as well. So it's a double-sided point, but the point is well taken. When it rises so quickly, it creates this very sudden uh, pressure for higher property. There's two issues. One issue is just the unfairness that, that a lot of people are concerned about. Where one property is worth more and you're paying less property. The other issue is just the way to grow. I mean, the honestly, this is off the spigot. If one of the percent is going to get this much as the property tax capitalist, that's what you're getting. And then now, with that, you are forced to make decisions. Obviously, the city doesn't want that. It has some huge implications for spending and, and what gets spent on and what doesn't get spent on. And as you know, State, the governor has imposed a two percent spending cap. It's caused a lot of life for a lot of people, um, and it has concerns in terms of how we control certain uh, certain costs. But it does limit um, uh, this issue. So we just have to make a decision about how we want to uh, address this going forward. Next question: How do they address seniors who are living in a property for forty to fifty years and find the burden to pay their taxes? Well, number one is the senior. Uh, is the exemption. Um, so if you are here, make sure you come to the Department of Finance to see if you're eligible. You might be able to get a reduction on your property taxes. Uh, and that's probably the biggest savings you can find uh, as it relates to your tax rate.
please stop by afterwards. We can help you with your application, and we can let you know about a series of events that we host every month where people can get more information and assistance with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that, that actually answered a bunch of the questions that we got. People submitted questions about. So let's get around here a little bit. Um, can the city reappraise all the homes to make the taxes more equal for everyone? And let's go with the budget limitation much because we've covered that in a bunch of different ways. That's one of the things we're looking at. How do we have a fair assessment across the board? Um, this is a question from a senior um, on a fixed income uh, asking about not raising the taxes. We hear you. I think if you need help, talk to the Department of Finance, especially if you're living in a fixed income. And if you don't currently uh, well or don't currently take advantage of the senior assistance, um, uh, exemption, please make sure you do. We have a very specific question here about a very specific property. Uh, I think the best bet for this is to talk to the Department of Finance directly. It's about a class four commercial property with uh, office space and some residential income and whatever. Just talk to the Department of Finance. Uh, if you're not able to talk to them tonight, we will be in touch with you. We can get you a better answer uh, on that. This is a question for these people. Uh, why can't money from the grants go directly to homeowners rather than through bank programs? Well, the money actually does go to the homeowners. Okay. okay, so the money, the grant programs, the city has our grant programs, the state had a phenomenal grant program called MAP uh, that actually uh, consolidated here and asked uh, to get funded. And, uh, uh, and that money goes directly to the homeowner uh, to, uh, if you're buying a house, money can go towards your down payment, if you might not have enough savings, uh, it goes towards your closing costs, the MAP program, um, and there are other programs. Uh, so let's say you're having trouble, you call this time, you need a little bit of support, that money goes directly to help offset your burden. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what class is a big property with two stores between residential? I think that'd be a class four. going to reduce our taxes? I'm sorry? How are you going to reduce our taxes? Well, that's what we've been talking about all night. We have to do it. There are a bunch of ideas that have been out there that experts have proposed. We are waiting for the city's tax commission to finalize their recommendations. I mentioned a couple of things that I've worked on with Senator Benjamin. When the legislative session comes back all in January, we, I fully expect that this will be a, a prime topic of conversation. I know certainly will be from my office. We'll be working a lot on this. Um, I hate to say this because it sounds like a cop out, but it's, I don't mean to be a cop out. It's, it's complicated. We have different types of buildings taxed in different ways. Different buildings with the same class are taxed differently. The 
there's a lot of moving parts here, and there's no one answer to solve it all. It's not a flip the switch. And I don't say that to dismiss the importance of all this. I say that to say it's complicated, it's sophisticated. We have to figure out the right combination of multiple solutions to solve the overall problem. We might not be able to fix it in one year. Like Senator Benjamin said, maybe we have to take a couple of intermediate steps next year before we're able to tackle wholesale reform. We don't know exactly yet, but this is something that we're talking a lot about. I know I'm talking a lot about. I have my staff doing a lot of research on this. Um, and this is gonna be important for all of us. No one's dismissing the importance of this. So uh, that's the commitment I can make to you tonight. I can't tell you when we're gonna lower your tax, I wanna tell you that we're gonna try to do the best we can to do it as quickly as we can. Okay? I think those are all the questions that were submitted. I'll, I'll, we'll take just two or three more audience questions and we have to turn it over and let to wrap up. But our representatives from my office, Maddie and the Department of Finance, will stay here as well so that we can continue to help you. Uh, I'm gonna call people who haven't had a chance to participate yet, okay? Yeah, I have one a serious question that nobody seems to be addressing. Everyone, everyone's looking at this. Everyone, everyone is looking at their property tax and property values. Why aren't we looking at the proportion that homeowners pay? Instead of it being 30% of the overall budget, why aren't we paying 25%? And why isn't that whole 5% being taken up to tax the people that are making the money off these properties, like the developers, like the finances, like the banks, et cetera, et cetera. That's really where we can save on our property taxes by interviewing whether or not you have a two-bedroom co-op in Park Slope. Well, I'm talking to my own husband here, who, we have friends in Park Slope. They pay comparable taxes. We have a one-family home in Bay Ridge with a driveway and a garage. They have a three-family home that generates $7,000 a month at least in income. We bought our homes at a time, 10 years apart, where we paid about a quarter of a half a million dollars for our house. They paid about a half a million dollars for their house in Park Slope 10 years earlier. They're 10 years older than us. There's a, there's a reason why caps happen, that all of these things are addressed in those scenarios. So the real issue is why are we paying 30, 40% of the budget for our properties? That's the question. Yeah, look, look that's, a, that's a very fair question. Um, and I'll give you two responses to that. Number one, um, I can't speak for everyone on this panel. I'll say from my perspective, and from my view, you know, the city's budget is made up of property taxes, income taxes, a bunch of other miscellaneous things, and then state transfers. So state, the state government supports the city as well. I think people who make a lot more income should be paying a lot more on income taxes in the city of New York and the state of New York. I think if you're making $10 million, you should be paying taxes if you're paying $10 million. $50 million, you pay taxes like that. That's one way to reduce the property tax share of the overall city budget. And the other thing I'll say, and you alluded to this, is we have luxury homes, luxury condos in this city that pay effective tax rates of zero percent because they've been giving tax abatements and they've been giving four twenty one A exemptions in order to incentivize their development and allow the front of the construction costs up front. And as a result, they pay no taxes for 25, 30 years in homes and condos that are worth over $100 million. I don't know a single person that can afford a $100 million home, and if they can, they can most be able to pay the taxes on that $100 million home. But we've got a policy, it's changed, but for about 10 or 12 years in the city in the 2000s, where we were rapidly incentivizing luxury development and giving up property tax revenue as a way to incentivize that development. And now we're stuck with the consequences of that. So I hear you 100%, 1,000%, it's a big problem. I don't know if anyone else wants to. No, I think Andy said it as well as you could say. The only thing I would just add a little bit to add to that is I mean, the mayor makes that decision. So, I mean, the question is, you know, that 30% is a decision he makes, right? And so, but I think to Andy, to Andy's getting to the other line issue, which is the sheet on not the money that you utilize. He's making that number based upon what's available in the other components in order to, to, to pay for the spending. Yeah, the property is going to pay for the amount. In addition to that, you should know this is. Benjamin, your district, I understand there's a luxury property held up right now 
that was supposed to have an apportioned amount of affordable housing. It turns out to be something like less than 10% of it is going to be affordable housing. And it's affordable to whom? So they got a huge tax payment up the home on that project. I forget the name of it. I'm sure you know about what I'm talking about. Uh, there are a number of other uh, ones. Like, it's a hard one. I'm actually talking about like, you know, you're up there, and they were supposed to have a big problem. No, but to answer the point, listen, my district is a beneficiary of the system, I'll be frank. We've had rapid gentrification, and a lot of people were going to make buildings half after the budget because they wanted to incentivize people building things like our own store. Right, what I'm saying is they're not actually building affordable housing. All of them. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. So I, I proposed a bill this year, I introduced a bill that would remove the cap on assessed value growth for homes that are valued greater than three million dollars with a household income of greater than two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. Right? That's the key there, right? Now that, that was just my proposal. It hasn't gone anywhere yet. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to keep pushing for it. Uh, we introduced the bill. When, when we go back to Albany starting in January, I'm going to keep pushing for that, as well as other pieces of reform. That, like I said, there's many different there's many different solutions that have to come together to fix this. It's not just one. Here's one potential avenue to help fix the overall mess. In all fairness to Andrew Bill, we are waiting for the mayor of the city of New York to, pro to propose. Proposal uh, for the property tax So we, we would like to have the, the action be comprehensive and make sense. And so I think part of the stall in this bill is waiting for what we get from this property tax We don't care about the
Uh, and I want to thank the JCA for giving us this space. Thank you everyone. Thank you.